We will now use the direct algebraic definition of the determinant to demonstrate the property that the determinant of A transpose equals the determinant of A. In other words, taking the transpose leaves the determinant unchanged. And as you know, this is a very important property because it allows us to switch from talking about the columns of the matrix to talking about the rows and vice versa. I will leave it up to you to prove this property for general 2 by 2 matrices. And we will start with 3 by 3 matrices. And if these are the values of A, then below are the values of A transpose. And there are several different ways to describe the relationship between A and A transpose. You could say that the rows of A become the columns of A transpose. Or you could say that the matrix flips its values with respect to the main diagonal. It's kind of a reflection with respect to the main diagonal. For example, these two values will trade their places, and these two values will trade their places, and these two values will trade their places. And finally, the values on the diagonal will remain where they are. Or you could describe the process of the transpose from the point of view of subscripts. Whereas in the original matrix, the first subscript denotes the row, and the second subscript denotes the column. In the transpose, if you use the same symbols for the same values, now the first subscript denotes the column, and the second subscript denotes the row. And this is very helpful in figuring out the expression for the determinant of a transpose in terms of the entries of the matrix A. And I did it right here. On the top line, you see a familiar expression for the determinant of A in this standard form. And the expression on the bottom was not difficult for me to obtain because I didn't have to figure it out from the beginning. I simply looked at the expression above and I switched the indices because as we just discussed, the operation of the transpose is equivalent to switching the indices. So that's what I did to get from the top expression to the bottom expression. And you can't see it in the first term because all of them are on the diagonal, but you can see it right here. 2, 3 becomes 3, 2. 3, 2 becomes 2, 3. And I did it everywhere else. Take a look. And now the question is, are these expressions equivalent? Well, let's take a close look. What happened in the first term? Well, clearly, it remained the same. Let me get to this side. These two are the same. All right. What happened here? Well, this entry is not the same as this entry. But what happened was they traded places. And so in aggregate, this term still equals this term. What about here? Same thing. These two entries traded their places. And so these two terms are also the same. Let's take a careful look here. Are these two terms the same? I don't think they are, because this one has a12 and this one doesn't. But this term became this one. Do you see that? a12, a23, a31. They're in the wrong order, so to speak, but they're equivalent terms. So let me connect them by a line like this. Okay. Well, what about this one? Well, this term became this one. So even though as individual terms they are different, in the aggregate sum they are the same. And finally, in these two terms, these two values simply trade places. And so these two terms are equivalent. So some things happened, and the expression on the bottom does not appear in the standard form. But it is the determinant of A transpose because it was obtained from the determinant of A by switching the subscripts. And as we can see, in aggregate, these two expressions are equivalent. And so this proves that for general 3 by 3 matrices, the determinant of A equals the determinant of A transpose. And we could have seen the same thing, and it will be helpful, if we remembered the Russian way of evaluating determinants for 3 by 3 matrices and realized what happens to each of the patterns. 
and we would have noticed that four of the patterns simply flip into themselves and two of the patterns trade places. The two patterns that trade, place, that trade places are this one and this one. That's the two terms right here. All of the other terms, patterns, are symmetric with respect to the main diagonal. So when you do the flip, they flip into themselves and that's what you saw on some of the other terms, including this diagonal term where every entry flips into itself. And so from that point of view too, we realize why the two determinants are the same. Because when you do the flip, when you do the transpose, every pattern either remains itself, if it's symmetric with respect to the diagonal, or it flips, or the two, or two pairs trade their places. The one outstanding question that we were able to answer here by inspection is that of sine. What would happen in the general case? We would be able to make the same observation, but the question of sine will remain outstanding. So let's take a look at what would happen in a general case by taking a look at a specific term in a 5 by 5 matrix. It's this pattern, the pattern that we considered previously. And under the transpose, it becomes this pattern. And I think once we understand what happens here, we'll be entirely convinced that this identity always holds. So let's convince ourselves that this pattern becomes this one under the transpose. In the original matrix, we have row 1, column 2, row 2, column 3, row 3, column 5, row 4, column 4, and row 5, column 1. In the flip matrix, it becomes column 1, row 2, column 2, row 3, column 3, row 5, column 4, row 4, and finally column 5, row 1. And I think this convinces us that this determinant and the determinant of A transpose will consist of the same n factorial terms. The question of the sign is still outstanding, so we'll give it a great deal of attention in just a moment. But it's clear that the collection of the terms is the same. If you listen to the very definition, it calls upon us to come up with all possible combinations of entries, so that there is exactly one in each row and one in each column. Even that definition treats rows and columns absolutely equally. So when you take the transpose, in other words, you turn the rows into columns, it's clear that the same, that, that definition will lead to the same collection of terms. And the only outstanding question is that of sign. Do these, does this term in this determinant and this corresponding term, which has the same absolute value from this determinant, come with the same sign? Well, let's find out. We have to take a very close look at the permutations that correspond to these two terms and they will be very different, but related permutations. Let's see. For this one, the corresponding permutation is 2, 3, 5, 4, 1. All right, in this one, we have to be careful now. It'll be 5, 1, 2, 4, 3. Once again, 5, Again, we have to go row by row because now we're making an appeal to the definition, which is row-wise. So going row by row, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, so as you can see, these permutations are totally different. So the question of sign remains acute. Well, let's find out if the signs are the same. Do these permutations have the same parity? And if you recall, this permutation is odd because it takes five switches to go from this permutation to the zero permutation because it takes four switches to bring one to its rightful place, pushing all of the other values to the right, and then one additional switch for the four and the five. So five switches, odd parity. Well, what about this very different permutation? Well, something similar happens, even though it's a different permutation. Now the 5 needs to go 4 switches to get to its rightful place, so 4 switches, and then an additional switch to switch the 4 and the 3. 
So once again, five switches. Once again, an odd permutation. And that's a good sign. That means that in the five by five determinant, these two related terms will appear with the same sign. But is it a coincidence or is it a general rule? Well, of course it is a general rule. Because even though these permutations are different, they're very much related. They are the inverses of each other. Look what the first permutation is saying. It says, put the second item in the first slot. Put the third item in the second slot. The fifth item in the third slot. The fourth item in the fourth slot. And the first item in the last slot. And this one says, put the last item in the first slot. The first item in the second slot. And so forth. But let's revisit this. It says, put the, the first one says, put the first item in the last slot. And this one says, put the last one in the first. This one says, put the second into first. And this one says, put, put first into second. This one says, put third into second slot. And this one says, put third in the second slot. And they both say, leave the fourth item where it is. So these two permutations are always the inverses of each other. And from studying permutations, you must remember that permutations that are the inverses of each other have the same parity. It's not difficult to see why. It's for the same reason that seven and minus seven are both odd, and eight and minus eight are both even. When you do these permutations one after the other, when you add them, so to speak, you end up at the zero permutation. And so it's not possible that it would take an even number of switches to get to this permutation and then an odd number of switches to undo it. That's the very basics of permutation theory. So permutations of the patterns that are related by the transpose, while different, are always guaranteed to have the same parity. And that's why all of the n factorial terms in both determinants are always the same and always come with the same sign. And this proves that the determinant of A transpose always equals the determinant of A.